Being a caregiver has many challenges, and one of them is balancing work, finances, and taking care of your loved ones. Thanks to New Jersey's Family Leave Insurance, balancing your life has become easier. Join us to learn more. Hello and welcome to Aging Insights. I'm Kathy Rowe, Executive Director of New Jersey Advocates for Aging Well, and today I have two guests to talk to us about one of New Jersey's best kept secrets, the Family Leave Insurance Program. We have Yara Wil Wilman Cole from New Jersey Citizen Action and Dr. Becky Logue Conroy from the Center for Work and Women at Rutgers. I want to welcome you both here today because I know how difficult it can be caring for a loved one, caring for yourself and your family, the work, the bills. It really can be overwhelming for people. And people meet, need to make hard choices between what they do, uh, what they can do, their caregiving demands. But the Family Leave Insurance Program can make a huge difference. So let's begin exploring this really important program. Um, Yara, what can you, can you describe for us what the New Jersey Paid Leave benefit is and what it can be used for? Yes, thanks, Kathy. Um, so paid family leave in New Jersey, as you already described, is called Family Leave Insurance, or FLI mm -hmm. for short. And it's a program that's actually been around for 15 years in New Jersey. And it provides partial wage replacement when you take leave to care for a loved one, mm -hmm. bond with a new child, or if you need to take time uh, for reasons related to domestic violence or caring for someone uh, for reasons related to domestic violence or sexual, sexual assault okay. as well. Um, but the, the benefit is really available for folks who are working so that they can make a decision about what is in their best interest and mm -hmm. their, their loved one's best interest so that they have a choice, whether they take some time off and use the benefit for six weeks or eight weeks or 12 weeks okay. in, a, in a 12 month period. It's really up to them. Um, it's available every 12 month period for um, 12 weeks, okay. 12 consecutive weeks. Okay. If you do take it less than the 12 consecutive weeks, it reduces to eight weeks in a 12 month period if, if you take it intermittently. So That's if you took like two benefit. weeks here and then you could take six weeks mm -hmm. later on, but it wouldn't add up to 12 weeks, mm -hmm. 12 weeks if it's straight through. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and then some more details. So when I say partial wage replacement, it replaces your wages 85% of your average wage with a cap mm -hmm. of 1,055 a week, okay. which is for this year, 2024. Mm -hmm. It does adjust every year. The cap adjusts every oh, year. Good. It'll go up. Uh, depending on sort of the calculation of, of how they come up with that amount. Right. Um, so we'll see what it is for next year towards the end of the year. But for now, it's 1055 a week, and it's 85% of your average wage. Um, yeah, so that's sort of the overview of the benefit. That is, that is great. And so who is eligible for the program? And to take leave to care for a loved one, does it have to be a specific relative, like a parent or a child? Who can be the caregiver, and what does it entail? Um, yeah, well, a couple things. First of all, it's important to just note that most workers are actually eligible for the benefit. Okay. Um, there's a few exemptions. I'll tell you first who's exempted. It's federal workers. Okay. It's uh, workers that are actually independent contractors. Okay. Um, so they're not actually employees. Right. And also folks that are working for like a religious and an employer okay. are typically exempt from okay. this benefit. But Otherwise, most folks are covered. They just have to reach minimum earnings eligibility qualifications for the benefit. So you have to have earned $14,200 in mm -hmm. about a year, year and a half before okay. you take leave. And that could be with any employer in New Jersey, not just the one that you're currently taking leave oh, from. Okay. It's sort of a portable benefit in that sense. Um, and then you also... Um, um, could reach that amount by working 20, 20 weeks, okay. earning um, a minimum amount in those 20 weeks. Um, we can put the graphic on the screen for your viewers so they can see that, so they can see the eligibility mm -hmm. for that. Um, but there's very few exemptions. Like most folks um, are surprised to learn that the majority of workers are right. in fact eligible. Wow, no, that is, that is great to know. And I think that so many people just aren't aware of it. Mm -hmm. um, so Becky, we know that often it's women who are caregivers and um, family leave can help women with their own economic situation, their well-being, their financial security. So how does paid leave also help men um, take leave as caregivers? Sure. So I just want to say a few things about how paid leave insurance helps or family leave insurance helps women. Mm -hmm. So often women are caregivers, like you said. Right. And so family leave insurance allows them to take some time out of the workforce 
but still continue to get paid so that they don't take a financial hit for taking yeah. that leave, which often happens when they take an unpaid leave or leave the workforce altogether. Mm -hmm. And one of the issues with leaving the workforce altogether, as we know, is that then you stop paying into things like social security, like your retirement accounts. Right. So if you take an extended absence out of the workforce, you're losing the accumulation of those benefits, right. that money. So it's not just the time that you're taking off. Right. It really affects you in the long run. Yes, yes. Right. And so leaving the workforce altogether you know, is a problem in that sense. Yeah. But if you take your leave, take six weeks, take eight weeks, take 12 weeks, women are often caregivers, and so they're the ones who often take that time. Mm -hmm. They can leave the workforce, take that leave, get paid at the 85% wage replacement, and then return to their job Okay. so that they can continue paying into those benefits and that yeah. they can t continue to care for their families and to be financially stable. Right. And the thing that I would say about men is that it works in two ways. It helps men, but it also helps women. Mm -hmm. Often, women are the ones who take leave, so employers may see them as the ones who are caregivers and so may treat them that way, mm -hmm. even if they don't do it consciously, right? So they okay. might not give someone a promotion. They might decide not to give benefits to someone who took six or eight weeks, not benefits, a promotion mm -hmm. or a bonus right. to someone who took six or eight weeks. They may say that person was gone for part of the time, so they okay. don't deserve this benefit. Whereas they see men as this sort of ideal worker norm, the person who okay. is dedicated to their job and may have a family at home, but aren't the primary caregiver. Mm -hmm. But something like family leave insurance that is gender neutral gives both men and women the yeah. access to this 12 weeks. And the more that men take it, the mm -hmm. less that women would be seen as the primary caregiver and therefore may actually end up closing some of that gendered wage gap because yeah. employers may not see workers in these gendered ways right. anymore. Right. So by, by using it and expanding it, it can help break down these stereotypes right. that we're still fighting to overcome. I remember when I was you know, first working, there was... Um, so the company I worked for had paternity leave, and one of the really nice guys on the team, his wife had a baby, and he didn't take it because he didn't want to be looked down on. Like, you know, what if I don't get a raise later on because I took off right. two weeks for paternity leave? Right. And you know, that was a long time ago, but we're still fighting these stereotypes and these issues. So, sure. And so. many of us have elderly parents, aging parents, yeah. people that we want to be able to take care of, and we have siblings. Mm -hmm. And if there's a way for us to you know, divide that care or divide that caregiving across generations oh, okay. or across siblings, something like that, where like if you have three siblings who live in New Jersey and are mm -hmm. able to take family leave insurance, you may be able to add some number of weeks together that a brother and two sisters or two mm -hmm. brothers and two sisters or three brothers could take to care for an aging parent. Mm -hmm. And if we encourage more men to take leave, they're more likely to do that care mm -hmm. for their own parents. Whereas I think, pre you know, in historically, women have even cared for their in-laws, Yeah, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So this gives people the opportunity to spread that care across men, women, whoever yeah. needs to and take. And I'll just add that one important detail of the program is that you can take um, the leave to care for any loved one. Mm -hmm. You get to define who is a loved one, somebody okay. who is close enough to be considered family, but it actually may be your neighbor. So if you okay. don't have siblings <laughs> right. and you do want to get some help uh, caring for your aging parents, you don't even have to divide it among um, your blood relatives. Okay. You could actually look to other other folks in the space that your 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 aging parent or any yeah. loved one um, you know relies on support. So it could be a neighbor that you're close with that right. relies on you for support, um, especially as folks age and live longer. Mm -hmm. You know they need to have more options for who they can rely on yeah. to where they can seek that support yeah. from. And we have such a shortage of home care workers, home health mm -hmm. aides, which. Uh, even if you can find one, it can be very expensive for mm -hmm. people. So if you, so, what you're saying is, from the patient perspective, mm -hmm. you could have like 12 weeks of your daughter and then 12 weeks of your son and maybe a neighbor. So throughout the year, you could have coverage for all your needs and not if you can't pay for or find a home care worker. Yeah, I mean, the one detail I do want to add also is that for um, receiving family leave insurance, the benefit for caregiving, you do have to have medical certification okay. in the application. Okay. So that means essentially that, you know, the doctor overseeing the care for, for the individual um, has to provide some sort of 
condition or diagnosis usually. All right. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be an acute situation like recovering from you know, surgery. That, of course, mm. does count. But it could be just something that is saying, oh, this individual does need some caregiving. So mm. it just sort of really relies at that point on the, the health care provider. And there mm -hmm. does need to be some education with health care providers in terms of how they can certify claims for individuals depending on what they're going through, okay. what their needs are. Um, it doesn't mean that um, we've had situations where healthcare providers, you know, said that they couldn't certify a situation because the individual was in a hospital and was receiving the care that they needed. That's not the case, right. obviously, as you know, even just caring for someone as a, a family member who's going through surgery and in the hospital, in their recovery, they still need someone to help manage yeah. the, the care for that. So that, you know, that healthcare provider um, may need a little bit of education and support to know what they can actually certify right. the family they benefit for. Okay. Yeah. No, that's a really good point. I wanted to just add one more thing. I think one of the benefits of having this expanded definition of family is you start to create these communities of care mm -hmm. because sometimes your blood relatives live far away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Many people don't work or live in the place they grew mm -hmm. up, even if their families remain there. Mm -hmm. So we, this is a way to expand your own community of care, to care for each other mm -hmm. in a way that you may not be able to do without this expanded definition of family. Mm -hmm. So I think that is one of the special things about New Jersey's family leave insurance program is that we do have this expanded definition of family yeah. such that you can use your community mm -hmm. as your caregivers, again, as long as, the, um, as long as you're certified by a medical provider right. that the, the care yeah. is needed. But that really is something special, I think, about that definition of family, yeah, the, chosen the, family. The broad definition, chosen family, yes, is especially important. But just the idea that uh, as long as you have access to the healthcare provider, you're close enough to that individual mm -hmm. that you are there and you understand what they're going through and you're speaking with their healthcare provider yeah. and able to get that certification. That's sort of the the um, benchmark that you have to meet mm -hmm. in terms of you know the being considered a loved one of okay. that individual. Okay. <clears throat> so you know, if someone finds themselves in this position, what do you suggest? Like, what's the first steps? How do they bring this up with their employer? Mm -hmm. I mean, it depends, right? Because everyone is in a different employment situation. I mean, often we recommend that you just start to um, ask some questions. You know, if you have an HR department, if you have, you know, man a manager, then mm -hmm. just start to begin to ask, like, what is what is available to me? What are my options? But understand that often HR and employers may not even be aware themselves. Yeah. And so, you know, taking the first step to to see what's available and then also being able to provide information to your HR, to your employer about this program and letting them know that it's of no cost to the employer. So all they have to do is essentially cover your, your work while you're out on leave. Okay. Um, you may have to request a leave of absence mm -hmm. from the employer, from HR. And that's essentially the job security or job protection that is um, in the jurisdiction of the employer to approve. And we can talk about sort of the eligibility for that. Okay. It does get a little more complicated, <laughs> um, so I don't want to confuse folks, but that is essentially what the employer has to approve or not. Um, but in terms of the benefit itself, because it's a state program, mm -hmm. it's funded through only, the family leave insurance is only funded through uh, employee payroll taxes. Mm -hmm. You don't have to get your employer to approve it the, the benefit itself, yeah. the payment, you apply to the state for those benefits. Okay. And you do have to inform your employer about your need to take leave, what your plans are, what your approximate kind of timeline of how right. long you so expect to Right, so they can plan out. to cover you, right? And yes, and your employer may also have you fill out some paperwork kind of also requesting the medical certification so mm -hmm. that they are you know doing their due diligence and collecting okay. the information that the law does require them. And when I say the law, I'm referring specifically to the job protection laws. Okay. Um, for the employer and um, you know just hoping hoping that you have some backup if you do face an employer that is challenging like we we are able to kind of connect you with resources um, for groups that can help you in case you feel scared because yeah. sometimes people are afraid to actually mm -hmm. ask for this time off and it feel you feel very alone and isolated right, right. Um, if Especially you don't if have no that support. Especially if no one's done it before. If no one's right, done it. Right mm -hmm. and, and like you said HR might not even know about it mm -hmm. so Let's put up on the screen where you can get more information for human resources or your employer mm -hmm. so that if there's a question, here's where you can call and get sure. information to share with them. But I want to um, detour a little bit and can we talk about the difference between family leave and this paid family leave? Because there are job protections for taking family leave. Mm -hmm. but And this is different because you have the paid insurance. So can you 
just talk about the difference between the two and the mm -hmm. overlap of the two? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll, st I'll start off. Becky, you can chime in. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I do want to just acknowledge it is confusing, and this yeah. is where and we get a lot of um, misunderstanding. And I think people are familiar with family leave, right? They've heard of that. Well, but usually it's FMLA, yeah. which is the Federal Family Medical Leave Act, and okay. that's now 30 years old, I'm, I'm guessing. <laughs> but, you know, it's been around for a number of decades, yeah. and it's a national federal law, and it's basically what protects your job um, across the states. Mm -hmm. And you do have to have 50 employees, you have to work at your job a year, and you have to earn 1,250 hours. You have to work 1,250 hours. Okay. Um, and, you know, so that is going to protect your job for not only your own health, but also to care for a loved one or bond with a new child. Okay. And then we also have the New Jersey Family Leave. Mm -hmm. It's called the Family Leave Act, okay. um, the FLA, which very closely, <laughs> similarly sounding to the FLI, but it's yeah. just your job protection, not your paid leave benefit. Okay. Similar eligibility criteria in that you have to have worked a year and you have to have earned a thousand hours for that job protection, and you have to ha be an employer with 30 or more employees. Okay. And um, that only protects your job specifically for caregiving or bonding, not for your own health. So, you know, it's a little, yes, okay. and I'm going to put a chart <laughs> up so you can see the distinction between those. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I think one thing that's important about that is that people understand they're taking leave, but they don't necessarily understand that their wage replacement is separate from their job okay. protection. Okay. And that while most workers are covered mm -hmm. for family leave insurance, the wage replacement that Yara spoke about earlier, yeah. she talked about the eligibility, the eligibility for job protection is different. Yeah. And so one of the things that we found at the Center for Women in Work is that there is some number. There are some number of people, around twenty-seven percent of workers, who are still not covered by job protection, oh, even wow. though they may be eligible for the wage replacement. So they may be scared to All take right. that leave that they're mm -hmm. eligible for, that they've paid into, mm -hmm. because their job may not be protected. And we find that the people who are more often not protected are women. Okay. People of who make lower incomes, okay. younger workers, mm -hmm. and workers in care professions, food-related professions like fast food, things like that. Right. So home health aides, those kinds of professions that are often the most vulnerable. And the reason that those people are not often protected is because they may change their job in a year. So they may work okay. for more than one employer mm -hmm. across the course of a year. And you right. have to have worked for the same employer for the full year, right. or they may not have worked the 1,000 hours, or they may work for an employer with 30 or f with fewer than 30 employees. Right. So those are all the reasons that someone might not be protected. And we just find that sometimes the people who are not protected are often the most vulnerable and mm -hmm. who may be the most fearful that they'll lose yeah. their job or that they won't get a promotion if they right. take leave. And so that's kind of the issue is that they're paying into this insurance program, they're eligible for it, it is their benefit, right. but there is the added fear that mm -hmm. they may lose their job when they take this leave. Fear and confusion, right? Because mm, everything sure. we just said is so complicated. It, it is complicated. And one of the aims, you know, that we are trying to do is simplify this so that it is something that is more accessible and equitable, so that there aren't these barriers. Mm. So that's something that we yeah. all work on. Yeah. And it just sounds strange to think of that people who are professional caretakers are the ones most at risk of not being protected for taking care of someone else. Oh, that sure. just doesn't, right. shouldn't be that way. Um, so again, like where the fear comes from being fired, not having your job when you come back, um, it sounds like if employers knew more about it, and maybe that's from more people taking advantage of this, it becomes more common knowledge and that would relieve some of that fear. What are other things that we can do to let people know about it and promote this program, get the word out? Yeah, I mean, we work um, uh, with a lot of different types of groups and organizations um, to train them. We do um, trainings that are kind of train the trainers so that okay. we enable and empower individuals that maybe serve the public. Mm -hmm. uh, these are social workers, doulas, community health workers, mm -hmm. um, those types of in intermediaries um, so that they understand, you know, what is available so they can educate their clients because the the improvement in health and well-being outcomes mm -hmm. is, is there. There's so much res uh, 
research to, to show oh, that, yeah. that it, there is a lot of interest for like public health workers and those folks to understand why they should be sharing this information yeah. with their folks and not just let HR or employers be the only source of this information. Mm -hmm. um, it really is up to, to a wide range of folks to take this information on. And so we help do that training and education and the Center for Women Work has some really good resources as well. Right. And we know that the research shows that people trust their caregivers or trust their healthcare workers, like right. social workers. Yeah. If you have, you know, a family member who's sick or who has, you know, has to be out for six weeks or eight mm -hmm. weeks or something because of surgery or some major medical incident, they, you trust your social workers, you trust nurses, yeah. you trust the doctors. Those are the people that we're trying to help Okay. inform so mm -hmm. that they know how to speak to the family members yeah. of their patients or their clients to say, hey, mom, you could take leave for this or, right. hey, child of this person, yeah. you know, who's taking care of your father or grandfather or mother or grandmother, you have the opportunity to take this leave. Mm -hmm. And if a social worker knows more about it, if home health aides know more about it, if nurses and doctors know more about it, they're better able to inform their client or yeah. patient's family right. that, you know, this seems like the kind of thing that someone really needs a caregiver. So let's, you know, why don't you call the state or try or look at, into family mm -hmm. leave insurance? They're not ever going to be the people who are going to walk someone through applying for it or anything like that. Mm. But just the knowledge to know, right. like, hey, do you know this is available? Do you know that there is an opportunity for you to take it? Right and inform people of their benefit and mm -hmm. of those options so that people are getting that from a trusted yeah. source. Sometimes if people are afraid to talk to HR or if HR is not as knowledgeable, it's good to, when all of those healthcare workers or all of the people who may be intermediaries, those who are you know, between the patient and mm -hmm. you know and their care so yeah. that they can learn about it. Yeah, no, that, that's important. And as we look at more age-friendly health systems, you know, we talk about what matters and, and mm -hmm. how to help people maintain their independence. And I think that's really important to have the health care providers on board because it's not just the patient that's in front of them who may have had the surgery or the fall or whatever. It's the entire family is right. really the right. patient. Their caregiving circle is their mm -hmm. patient. So mm -hmm. we need to get the word out about that. Mm -hmm. So. When if someone decides that they, you know they they have the need for this, can you walk us through the process? So, mm -hmm. you know, I I need to take off to um, take care of my mother who had surgery, and what do I do? Mm -hmm. What are my first steps? Mm -hmm. Uh, start to gather resources and information. I, I, we can put up some of the uh, websites. We really recommend the state's website. Um, and we also have a website with information. And we also have a referral line if folks have questions and they are not able to really get the answers to what they're asking online. Mm -hmm. But start to gain some information um, and, and gather some resources. Talk to colleagues at your place where you work, see okay. if anyone has gone through it or is aware. That's always an option. But if you work for a smaller employer, if nobody in right. your in place where you work has gone through it. Yeah, you could one, be the first. You could be the first, yes. And as I said before, it is good to, of course, ask your employer, get some information from HR, see what they know, mm -hmm. and then also let them know what you're going through. Share yeah. share what the um, need that you have is about. Because actually, they do, under the law, have an obligation to tell you what your rights are, at least in terms of you know letting you know that this benefit exists. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes they don't know that it exists. So we do have to educate right, our employers right. as well. And then actually just decide what you need, like lay out your timeline, figure out what the medical care provider is saying is, is likely recovery time or the time that they okay. need some caregiving for. And some people decide that they want to take three weeks um, and then they want to go back to work and just take maybe a day here, a day there, depending on, okay. you know, what just and that depends. can add up to eight weeks, it right? It can add up to eight weeks when you do it intermittently, 56 days. Um, and then you go to the the, de the Department of Labor's website. It's mm -hmm. MileyBenefits.nj.gov. I said it really quick, but you'll see it on the, I, I'm sure we're going to put the, <laughs> put the, the website on. And you apply there. Mm -hmm. um, you can start an application early, but you can also just go in and apply for the benefit once you're out on leave. You're not getting pay from your employer. Mm -hmm. And you have the kind of idea from the medical provider what they will certify for. Okay. So they have like agreed to your 
kind of timeline that you've set out. Yeah. Um, keeping a notebook with all these like dates and, and details, I think, is always a good um, mm -hmm. thing to do as well. And then you go on and you apply for the benefit. And, you know, we do see there are some delays in claims being processed. Mm -hmm. um, intermittent, the intermittent processing is not a streamlined process at all. It's okay. the system that the Department of Labor is using for their claims processing was built in the 80s. Okay. Uh, they have not modernized <laughs> it. Um, so being aware that that could, could happen um, and preparing for that as, as best you can, obviously that's the big issue mm. that we do need to tackle in terms of government and the okay. ability to, to make it work. smoother. Mm. Our understanding is they are going to be modernizing and improving the program soon. So we're advocating to help, you know, the Department of Labor, yeah. you know, keep accountable to that timeline. Yeah. Um, but in the meantime, you know, you go on, you apply for your benefit, and then, you know, you, you hopefully will see a turnaround in, you know, three mm -hmm. or four weeks and get your money and you get it on a, a card that is mailed to you. You can transfer your balance to your oh, okay. uh, your own bank account and then you'll have the funds available to you if all, all goes smoothly, you know, within a few weeks of applying. Great. So Becky, can you um, close us out with talking about the challenges with accessing paid family leave and what the Center for uh, Women and Work has found in your recent fact sheet and research about this? Sure. I think some of the issues with access have to do with confusion, like we've mm. talked about so far, the confusion between the wage replacement and the job protection. So our newest fact sheet is about the job protection, is about the gaps that occur when people are not protected. So yeah. I talked about that a little earlier. Yeah. You know, we find that almost 30% of workers are not eligible for the may not be eligible for job protection, even if they're eligible potentially for the wage replacement. So there, I think a lot of the issue with access is confusion. Mm -hmm. But I also think, like Gera was just talking about when you're applying and thinking about and getting information, I think the other issue with access is sometimes things happen in an acute situation, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody needs surgery quickly. This right. is not yeah. the same as preparing for a baby to come. Right, you don't have any you, warning. <laughs> right, so some things happen where you don't have warning, where a child gets in an accident or you get sadly a cancer diagnosis or something like that where suddenly you are looking at surgery and mm -hmm. six weeks or eight weeks out where you have yeah. to care for somebody. So one of the things that I think is also a barrier to access is just the knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. So hopefully this show will help people to yeah. understand that building your own knowledge is preparing for the future, mm -hmm. knowing that at some point you may have to care for someone, whether that's yeah. your own child, whether that's your neighbor who you consider family, whether yeah. that's your parent or grandparent, we are all caregivers. And yeah. so knowing ahead of time that this is available to you, so looking at your paycheck and seeing mm -hmm. that you're paying into New Jersey's yeah. family leave insurance and noticing that on your pay stub, understanding your employer's um, leave policies yeah. inside their employer and how that coincides with the New Jersey mm -hmm. family leave insurance. All of those kinds of things I think are barriers to access and I think people can work on their knowledge but also closing the gaps mm -hmm. between job protection and, and um, eligibility for wage replacement is also really important. Well, thank you both. This is very informative and we are going to be talking about this a lot more. Thank you for joining us today on Aging Insights for information about family leave insurance. You can watch this and previous episodes of Aging Insights on our website, on YouTube, or listen to them as podcasts. To find resources for older adults and their caregivers in New Jersey, please go to our website at njaaw.org.